Uh, welcome to the uh, first Network Dead seminar of this academic year. Uh, my name is Jane Secker and I'm from the Centre for Learning Technology. Um, we've now made the Network Dead seminars uh, a regular part of the activities of the Centre for Learning Technology. Um, we've got five further seminars lined up um, this, this academic year already um, and we've been running it for, for two years to date. The seminars are designed to um, explore how technology is shaping education, um, the, the way that we can use various technologies to, to help in our teaching, but also um, in our research. And we use a variety of lightweight technologies to basically live stream these sessions so that they can be viewed uh, at the moment by an audience who, who will be watching anywhere in the world. Uh, we also record the sessions, um, but hopefully um, we will have some, some viewers watching us online at the moment. They may also be following the session in Twitter. So we use the hashtag LSE Net Ed for anybody who's following um, in Twitter. And if they do want to ask questions, uh, then people outside LSE will be able to do this. Um, today's speaker, I'm very pleased to uh, welcome, is Martin Hawksey. Um, Martin currently works at the Association for Learning Technology. His title is uh, What the Little Birdie Tells Me, and he's going to be talking to us about uh, Twitter in education. Um, I, I did a bit of Googling of Martin before he came. Uh, uh, unsurprisingly, he is on Twitter, so you'll be able to follow him. Uh, he's on Google+, he's on LinkedIn, he's on YouTube, he's got a blog. There, he's, there's a lot about Martin online. His interests are primarily about innovation and technology, and he describes himself as an educational technology explorer, which I rather like, actually, for a, a new job title. He's interested in uh, and has worked on massive open online courses, or MOOCs, which you probably heard of. Uh, he's also interested in mashups, Google Apps, social networks, and using data in lots of interesting and exciting ways. In the, the post that he wrote on his uh, blog, um, he, he was basically um, saying that in today's talk, he's, he's going to talk to us about using Twitter in education, including using it in kind of more passive announcement type ways, but also using it in much more interesting, active ways where you can engage students in discussions. Um, he also will hopefully give some examples about using Twitter for things like classroom voting, um, and using it to, to mine uh, Twitter as well for, for data, which we, we had a workshop on uh, over the summer. So as someone who uses Twitter myself, I'm very much looking forward to Martin's talk today. And uh, I hope that we'll have some uh, interesting questions for him at the end. So I'll hand over. Thank you, Martin. Thanks, Jane. Um, so I'm going to get the, the quick advert out of the way at the beginning uh, before we lose everyone off the stream. So... Uh, I, I'm associated with the Association for uh, Learning Technology. Hopefully um, you know of this organisation. If not, it's the UK's leading membership organisation interested in the field of learning technology. So you being in this room is a good indication that uh, it's an organisation that you, want, uh, you, you might want to be part of. We have over 1,400 um, members, mainly in the UK, from a variety of disciplines and backgrounds. Um, for LSE staff, uh, the good news is that as the LSE is an organisational member, staff can join as associate members for free. Uh, and the web address is at the bottom. So that's my quick advert out of the way. So as Jane said, the hashtag for uh, the session is LSE uh, Net Ed. Um, just also to say that... Um, there's various links to bits and pieces uh, through this talk, and they're all in a, a single link bundle. Uh, and the URL to that is here. It's um, Twitter, and then which is it's case sensitive, so Twitter capital E capital D. For those joining in from the live stream, if you go into that bundle as well, hopefully you'll see a link to uh, the PowerPoint broadcast. So. Um, you can keep up with these slides as I go along as well uh, and watch the stream as well. So, uh, I thought we'd start with a bigger picture uh, just to con contextualise why I think something, a 
a technology like Twitter could be very beneficial to education. So this is a, a little short video um, that I've got queued up. So for I should probably actually ask, um, before I go too deep in talking about Twitter, do you all know what Twitter is? <laughs> Any, no? Does everyone understand the mechanics of Twitter in terms of tweeting, messaging? I'm going to presume so. So, um, this, this video is two minutes long, and so if you are on Twitter, um, it would be great for me to see your reaction to this video as I play it uh, using the LSE Ed hashtag um, as we play the video. So your thoughts, your reactions as we go through. And um, I'll try and summarize those at the end as well for everyone. So here we go. So there we go. So what, what are your thoughts on, on that proposition there? Do you feel we're in a, a different age now? We've had generation Y, X, Z. Um, are we now in the connected age? Thinking back to my own experience, uh, I was graduated in 99. Uh, at university, and it was a very um, local education. It was at the institution. It was on the campus. Um, the people I had contact with were my fellow colleagues, um, my my tutors. But if I think about my own personal learning now, it's 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 you know it's turned inside out now. It's I'm making connections with um, leading academics in the fields that I'm interested across the globe in almost real time. Do you think our institutions have taken this on board in terms of their delivery? Are they maximizing the, the full benefit of this, this age, this era, where so many of us can connect and exchange ideas so rapidly and quickly? Any thoughts? That's a rhetorical question, isn't it? Well. <laughs> Do, do you do you just disagree? Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, nothing can be more disconnected than academia, and 
So when you look at disciplines, so it's, uh, people are really very insecure about using these technologies. Hmm. And so uh, the possibilities are there, but the reality is very different. I think that's a very valid point, that we are asking people to live out in the open, which not everyone's comfortable with doing. I think I, I would say that a lot of students are probably not using these. You know, you're, you're talking about what you might do as a professional mm. to network with, you know, leading thinkers in the field. But I think that's quite a different experience if you're a student studying, that, that you're probably not uh, engaging with, uh, you know, leading thinkers on Twitter. You're more likely to be following a celebrity or something. But... Uh, do you, do you think is that, that is because of the lack of opportunity or direction from I, the institution I think at the to moment, do that? I, I think a lot of students probably aren't really aware how to mm. use these tools in a, a more sort of scholarly way, I'd say. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, I would disagree with that. I, I think we're talking about different types of learning. Um, what you do as a, what the kind of learning you do as a professional is quite different in character to what students are doing. And I think that a student studying, say, gender studies, whatever, may have an interest in a particular area of that in particular. And they may well follow particular thinkers on that subject. But that's, that's a kind of a, a more sort of popular use of, of, the, of learning. It's not directly... It's not the same as the learning they're doing to, to pass their exams and get their degree. Mm. And so I, I don't think it's right to say, oh, they're just all following celebrities. They probably are engaging in a scholarly way, but that's not necessarily covering all of their studies at university. It's a slightly different type of scholarship. So also in there, there's the informal formal idea. Yeah, I, I think that's what it is. I, uh, yeah, I guess that's, that's one way of putting mm. it. So... The, this, that kind of outlines the way I approach this presentation. And um, I want to now go and, as, as Build, talk specifically about Twitter. What I want to do is just open your eyes, really, to, to the possibilities. I'm not saying that anything I'm presenting is de facto correct. Um, that's up to you to, to make your professional judgment. Um, just to say about you know my own personal journey using Twitter, uh, I did the usual, uh, signed up February 2008, I was at work, I typed at work, a uh, couple of minutes later I've uploaded my picture, uh, I've linked Twitter to Gtalk, still working, and that was me for a year, I didn't touch it again. Um, but you know, they're very kind of short statements of uh, almost kind of forced um, reflections on 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 my situation. But if you follow my Twitter stream now, it's uh, a varied and rich uh, stream of um, random thoughts quite often. But um, there's this footprint that people can follow and see. Um, this was a very useful um, diagram that I came across a couple of years ago. It's, it's a reworking of something that uh, Mark Sample um, came across. And it's looking at this idea of using Twitter in different modes. So on the bottom axis, you've got um, student activity from passive to active, uh, and then monologic to dialogic up the side. And one of the very useful things about this diagram for me was to think about the different modes in which a way uh, a technology could be, like Twitter, could be used within uh, educational settings. But it also occurred to me that I think uh, as professionals, quite often we're, we're guilty of uh, picking on technologies and not really implementing them uh, properly with with rigor. Um, I, I used to do a lot of support in terms of um, introducing electronic voting systems into classrooms. And instructors 
you know, they saw the benefits from the literature of, of this particular technology. But um, when it came to actual implementation of the class, they, I don't think they ever fully committed to it. They never fully looked at how their classes were designed. And so it was then just a, a very um, superfluous add-on to the class. So it wasn't maximizing benefit. And I think if you start looking at the different ways in which Twitter can be used, in a, a variety of tasks, you can perhaps uh, avoid some of that. So I just want to go into a couple of these as examples and just show you what's possible um, with them. Um, so if at any point uh, you have questions or uh, comments, please raise them. So this is the first thing that I think a lot of people don't realize. The, your institution is probably spending 3, 4p on um, SMS text messages, you know, broadcast messages to students. Well, if you um, had students signing up for Twitter, they could get free SMS messages. Um, Twitter, as part of its service, when you follow an account, you can actually receive a mobile notification of updates. Um, so this was an experiment that I actually first published in um, 2008, and uh, I was trying it out uh, the other day, it still works. Um, so the idea would be you would have a, a class account uh, where you'd send um, important information to students. It might be notifications about assignments or classroom changes. And if you direct students to register their mobile phone and uh, follow the account and tweak the settings on the back end, they'll receive an SMS text message on their phone. Um, Nowadays, there's actually a, a wide range of different mobile notifications you can get. Um, so you can get uh, SMS notifications for direct messages and so on. Some of this is um, partially obsolete nowadays because of mobile apps on the phones providing notifications anyway. Um, but I thought it was still a, a useful mechanism um, to, to get notifications in a very direct manner to students. Um, there is, obviously, uh, there's always a catch with these things. And the catch here is that not all the UK carriers are actually supported. Um, so this immediately raises the question when you're talking about Twitter and education is you've got an accessibility issue in terms of students might legitimately say, I'm not signing up for an external service. You've got students legitimately saying, I'm not on one of these providers, um, what, what are you going to do for me? And I think um, uh, academics have successfully adopted Twitter within an education setting, but it comes back to sender. You have to provide alternative means um, to access the data. Because Twitter is um, largely open, there are different ways to get that data, that information back to students. Um, so. That's kind of your, uh, your get out. Um, you can decide how floppy that get out is, but uh, I think the benefits um, um, potentially outweigh that. The other thing to, to mention is uh, uh, within the, the Twitter settings is email notifications. So Twitter have got millions of dollars of big data processing on the back end, and they can actually fill it through thousands of millions of stories and actually pick out some of the top bits. So again, if you've got a, a class um, Twitter account which you're using to follow your individual students, then you can use the power of Twitter to actually get some of the top stories out of your students without having to read everything that they post. Um, and you can get that as a, an email in a daily or a weekly digest. Um, and there are various other email notifications you can get, um, such as um, mentions and uh, follows and so on. So I think for uh, potentially for the busy academic, it fills in a, a nice little hole there. And this is what the summary right looks like. Um, so another nice feature of this is we got the avatars of the people. So there's this visual recognition of Oh, so and so also recommended this, like this, um, which gives it a, um, 
a level of um, authentic, authentic, well, um, clout, that sort of thing. And there's also a number of services to actually start pushing things into a, a if you did have a class Twitter account, that again removes the burden from you to do stuff. So uh, the one I use quite often is a service called Deliver It. And this allows you to register your uh, Twitter account. And then if you're familiar with uh, the, the, the world of RSS feeds, um, you could be getting notifications out of your VLE, pushing them into Twitter so that students don't need to sign into the VLE. They don't, they can, they've got another uh, means of doing this. And if they're getting these SMS updates as well, you're, they're getting that direct. Has anyone thought about using Twitter in that way? I'm getting a couple of nods and shakes. Let's go on to another one. So let's look at some uh, lightly structured activities. So this, um, a year later, after playing around with SMS and Twitter, um, someone I, f I follow, uh, not well, on Twitter, but as a, a, a blogger as well, is a guy called David Muir. And he was using Twitter a lot in his classroom as a, just a general discussion uh, back channel. But um, he was thinking, what, what, how could I actually use this technology to um, use it as an electronic voting system. One of the big problems David had was a lack of equipment. So he only had 50 voting handsets, but a class of 200. But he's got this very active back channel going on in Twitter, and he was wondering how to do it. And back in, back in that uh, 2009, Twitter actually supported um, RSS feeds. So you could structure something in terms of you could codify a question with a hashtag and then provide responses to it. So people could uh, respond to a question and then with a bit of free open source uh, mashing up, this is Yahoo Pipes, you could process that. And so within a day, I'd given David an electronic voting system with Twitter. The reason I've included this in example in is just to highlight that um, another issue with Twitter is the fact that it's a private company, it's their own service, and they, they can change the terms, they can change the playing field. And what, what has happened uh, in the last year is Twitter have stopped all RSS feeds. So this, um, to, this solution obviously relied on that, an easy way to get data out of Twitter uh, and process it with other tools. And so they've, they've broken that. But the good news is that uh, other people have taken up the challenge. So um, if I click on this, have you come across Poll Everywhere? Quite, oh, lots of users. Uh, let's see, here we go. Did you know that one of the options within Poll Everywhere is to vote via tweet? So they, I've, I've um, Poll Everywhere is a very nice service. It provides a number of ways for you to, um, to, to vote on polls. Um, you can vote via SMS, you can vote via a web browser, you can also vote via a tweet. And I've um, disabled uh, all those other methods and just given you a poll. So if you want to respond to this poll, if you just at poll with the code for yes or no, so if you want to vote yes, you go at poll in your tweet, space six triple eight one, and then I'll vote yes. And at poll, space six double nine two seven, we'll vote no. And you're free to vote. <laughs> so it's very responsive. So I'm, I'm not saying that 
you know, if I, if I was doing this in a, a classroom setting, I'd probably still provide the option for a text number. Again, accessibility, sender, alternative means. But I'll come back to this example later on. And um, you'll, you'll see how once you start digging into the back end of Twitter, there's still, I think, opportunities educationally to extend existing pedagogies. So um, voting uh, within classrooms, interactivity within classrooms is a well-researched um, topic. So you just need to look at stuff by Mazur or um, Hake. You can see the positive benefits of uh, incorporating uh, voting in your classroom. But I think there's opportunities to extend that. So we'll come back to the poll later. Uh, it's good to see that lots of you already know about that service. So one of the things that David Muir was interested in was the the in-class back channel, which I think is kind of the atypical usage of, of Twitter within education. There's some, um, oops, let me go to the right place. There we go. So one of the things uh, which is notable recently is um, the increasing usage of lecture capture. And one of the experiments that I'd, um, I did in 2010 was to actually, look, if you're playing back videos to students and you're asking them as a, like, as a, a structured activity to comment on, the, on that video, isn't there an opportunity to actually combine that? So the shared experience of watching uh, a video combined with the, the things that are being tweeted And this is what you get. You get a video playing back on the top and then replacing the subtitles with... Oh. Let me just mute that. So what you'll see is, as it's playing back, you can see the things that people are tweeting. So you're merging two worlds here. So, And you might wonder, other than providing perhaps a useful me means for students to go back over previous recordings and look at some of the critical moments, try and discover useful things that um, people discovered during the class. There's actually another reason for doing this. Before I more move on, does, does this make sense to you? I'm getting nods again. So why might you want to do that? You, well, you've enriched your resource. This is something we actually did for um, the 2010 uh, keynotes from the Alt-C conference. So um, during the, the event, we were recording the tweets made by the audience as they were watching the keynotes. Uh, this is the keynote that uh, Donald Clark gave on Don't Lecture Me. We put both of the videos, we, we put all the videos on YouTube. So this is the views um, his, his clip has got. So he's got over um, 7,000 views in three years. But as an experiment, we also put um, a version of the video on with a Twitter track. So same idea, we were subtitling the video with the tweets that were made at the time. The result is the video's had twice as many hits. The reason it's got twice as many hits is because Google can index it easier. So if you're promoting the use of lecture capture within your institutions and you're making those lectures available on the web, to combine it with the Twitter data means that you've got an audience of people metadata, meta tagging what's going on in the lecture for you and also perhaps enhancing that resource as well, providing additional context, additional meaning to it. <coughs> What's quite interesting as well is to look at over the last um, 
30 days where um, as well as we can see it's still outperforming in terms of views so um, you could argue initially that there was perhaps a, a mild Horforn effect in terms of people going for the shiny Twitter subtitled version over the others. We're still getting more views on this three years later. And people are watching it for longer as well, which I think is quite interesting. The anomaly, though, is that whilst um, we got 7,000 views to 15,000 views, um, the same uh, difference in the we're, we've got a doubling essentially. We haven't got a doubling in the estimated times minutes watched over the three year period. But the last 30 days indicates that there's something there. So will you all be going out with your lecture capture getting people, right, you have to tweet. So for the example, this webinar now, this seminar now, I can go back and I can give Darren a list of all the tweets that were made during this presentation and he can add it to the subtitles to the video. And um, I'm sure Darren spotted that the first example there was using JW Player. So he doesn't have to worry about that either. It works. I want so I think another you know the the way I opened this talk was the idea of um, you know we're in the connected age, and I think one of the uh, few academics that really recognizes this and is using that to the benef his benefit is a guy called Jonathan Worth at Coventry University. Since two thousand and eight, uh, Jonathan has decided that he wants to run his classes differently. He has 40 students, um, but, and the way he uses his lecture time is he has pre-recorded interviews with, um, I should have said it's a photography class. He has pre-recorded interviews, audio interviews with leading photographers within his field. And so when the students come in to the lecture, essentially they're, they're listening to that audio commentary. But he's directing them to, as we saw in the previous example, to tweet, uh, to share their comments and thoughts as they're collectively in class listening to that. But that experience isn't limited to the class. Because they're using Twitter, because the audio is available on the web at the same time as the class, he's got a global audience of people. He's got a global audience of photographers <coughs> chipping in as well. He's got a whole range of former colleague, uh, Jonathan ran a, a session earlier, earlier today and I, I noticed a former colleague of mine at JISC was joining in the conversation. So he's really trying to maximize the benefit of, he's got 40 students in his class, but in one of the iterations he had 35,000 people come to his, to his seminars virtually um, over the 10 week period. So those 40 students had potentially 34,960 fellow students, 34,960 tutors. Um, and there's a, a video I recorded recently with um, Jonathan about how he goes about this course and why he set it up in that particular way. Uh, and one of the things he's very clear to make uh, is it's not a MOOC, but it's an open class. It's got that, I think, ideal of um, open education. Um, so it has MOOC-like attributes, but I think this model can work in a, a whole range of disciplines as well. Um, he's doing it with photography. He's using audio and tweets. He's not even using photographs to do this so have you come across Jonathan's stuff before you should follow Jonathan clever guy I'm about to do some work with Jonathan to start 
seeing how we can use this data with this class and that uh, a more useful way for his students. And I'll touch upon one of those examples uh, in a second. So that's kind of a range of activities that um, I think you could use Twitter for some failed experiments, but I think some um, interesting ideas. Some thoughts from the room on that? Shall I just get back on the plane now to Edinburgh? fellow students um, as if it were going to be automatically received as a benefit. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I was thinking about what um, Jim Groom says about DS106 and how the, the, the students who join remotely can, they become an audience or a viewership for each other's work. And I think that works particularly well if you're 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 dealing with um, visual or or creative products, as Jonathan Worth is, as Jim Groom is. I was just wondering, is it always? Do you think it's always a benefit? Maybe I digress from Twitter, actually. So feel free not to mm. answer that. Um, I think it the the. We were talking about this over lunch. The risk is that it could be quite unnerving for students to have 35,000 people looking over their work to, to question their knowledge. So there's that aspect of it. Um, and I don't know if I've got an answer for that right now. Um, yeah. I was wondering when you were talking about the um, lecture capturing or also, for example, live tweeting during mm. a lecture or allowing questions that would then pop up on the screen and sometimes considerably bigger theatres than this one. We had this discussion a while back at the department on what that does to the person giving the lecture. What do you do with rude comments or with not so nice mm. um, tweets and, and, and how that affects the person lecturing or mm. teaching. Do you have any comments on that, perhaps? I think that's always the risk. Back to when I was um, introducing staff to electronic voting systems, um, one of the biggest fears that we regularly encountered was for the first time, staff were getting real-time ratings of, you know, they were getting real-time feedback about how good their teaching was. So if you get a whole class of people, you put a question up on the, on the board and you've got, um, you know, the majority of the class getting it wrong, what does that say about you as an educator? And I think that holds as well for, um, you know, if you were to put up a, a Twitter wall or something. Well, how do you take that feedback? But the balance of that is you are getting this potentially rich feedback in real time so that you can uh, adjust what you're doing. I've got half an eye on a, a Twitter feed here uh, wondering how I'm doing. Uh, um, but it is, a, I think, a valid issue as well because, you know, Twitter is public. Anyone could hijack your hashtag. Um, Twitter has got a lot better about detecting spam. It's got a lot better in terms of filtering um, a timeline to pre prevent profanity, pre pre profanity appearing. Um, yeah, 
some people do the admin of the event, invite the speakers, set up the room, mm. organize the Twitter feed, organize people to live tweet the event, and sort of kind of take for granted a little bit that the invited speaker that isn't really necessarily aware of all that going yeah. on in the background is actually going to be okay with that and mm. actually going to be happy to stand there and give their lecture and respond yeah. to instantaneous <laughs> feedback on, yeah. I think the key with all that is setting the expectations. Yeah. So you don't want to surprise people with something. I think as well, it's setting the expectations. If you're going to start using Twitter within your classroom um, to your students about, you know, we expect you to be respectful to others. We expect you not to you know, use profanity uh, and so on. Um, tying it into general you know, etiquette. Um, so I think expectations is the key one now. Uh, this is not a question from me. This is a question from Twitter. I'm not yeah. sure if you've saw, seen this one. From uh, uh, Joseph Kesselugu from, from Coventry University. Um, I think he knows your... Um, your colleague that you were just talking about, but he's, he's asked who should be teaching the new media tools for education and whether digital natives might know more about new technologies than educators. <laughs> uh, well, I think you, people like you have a, a good opportunity to educate academics about this sort of stuff. Uh, so learning technologies and... I, I think... Yeah, uh, I don't. I don't think it falls on any particular person. I think um, it was quite interesting talking to Jonathan when he started. Um, he knew nothing, so he used it as an own his own teaching, you know, his own professional development. You know, he, he said he made so many mistakes in the beginning. He, you know, the class now it uses a, a blog post for each week's. Um, seminar but when he started it was just one blog post and comments going on to the floor um, so I think it is possible even with no experience in this area to actually achieve stuff you probably make mistakes along the way um, but Jonathan commented that he found people very forgiving of that I think people welcomed the fact that he was trying to open up his class uh, and, and people have been nothing but, um, you know, helpful for him doing that. And now he can tweet and blog with the best of them. <laughs> well, now I want to kind of step this up a bit. So, um, I think there's a you know, there's, there's a level of, you know, there's practical things that you can do uh, using Twitter in education. But if you go up to another, uh, the next level, I think there are uh, a lot more possibilities um, and interesting things. So in particular, I'm thinking around social learning analytics. Um, analytics being, and learning analytics being a very popular thing right now. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to cover this area was because it, it really aligns to um, my personal journey as well. Is this is um, it's a forced layout diagram. It's a network. So each of these dots is a, is a, a, a Twitter account. And the dots are joined by lines. And those are connections between people. So let me pick out a nice example. Um, so there's a, a line from Sarah Knight down to uh, Jax Rafferty. So Sarah Knight follows Jax Rafferty. The, the, the nodes in here, they're, they're sized uh, based on a, a, um, a network um, measure. So the bigger the node 
is, it means the person is more of a, a, a bridge in the community. So, you know, they have more potentially influence in the community. There's essentially a shorter path. You see D. Kernahan here is one of the biggest nodes. So he, he, you know, someone down here can link to someone else here um, through Derek Kernahan. Um, and there's more of those linkages between different people. When I, this, this is um, the, uh, a community around a hashtag, UK OER. So these are people using the UK OER hashtag, and this is how they follow each other. And it's all a bit of a mess. But one of the things that um, intrigued me when I first started seeing these um, graphs appearing was, where am I? Where's, where's Wally? Where, where do I sit within this community? And I think it's, uh, it was very useful for me to, to start working out what this all means. You know, there is a social graph behind Twitter. Um, where you sit within that community, I think, gives you, uh, it, it gives you a sense of, of where you are. It gives you a, a situational awareness. Um, so in this case, um, I could see that someone like Mr. Nick, who's a, a big blob down here, might be, if I wasn't already following him, he might be a useful person to connect with in this community. That's the two minute introduction to <laughs> social network analysis. There, there are various things that you can do with um, network analysis like this. So we can see disconnections within the community. You can see who is isolated from, the, from this community. As I mentioned, you know, the information brokers, the big nodes, um, the, the people that are pushing or pulling or connected in the best way. Um, and this whole idea of you might be able to identify people within your community that you're not already aware of, who might be useful for your own personal learning and development. And the last one to, um, you know, this whole I notion of situational awareness. Now, there are various ways that you can generate that graph. And my introduction into it was a, a tool called Node Excel, which is a, it's a free open source add-on for Excel. Um, so it's easy to download and install. And one of the really nice things about this tool is that you can actually start pulling data from various social networks, including Twitter, and start producing those graphs. One limitation I should say about Node Excel is that it's for Windows only, so Mac lovers, I'm sorry. Um, but there, there are ways around this which I'll come to. And so using Node Excel, I was able to explore the communities I was involved with uh, in to see how I was situated within those, generate the data myself and start producing graphs like this, um, providing a, a map of, of the networks. One of the, the issues with Node Excel is you've got this graph, it's in Excel. I think you can, um, you know, in some ways get completely lost in, in the graph um, doing personal exploration, but, um, it's quite hard to share that with other people to see for them to see uh, what's going on um, to start making sense of it as well for themselves. Um, and then, so a couple of years ago, I started a project called Tags, which tried to, it, its primary aim is to open this up to a wider audience. Just as Node Excel lowers the bar slightly in terms of integrating into Twitter um, how could I do something similar um, that anyone could install, use, regardless whether they've got Excel, Mac, PC? This is where tags came about. So the challenge is to take data from 
Twitter uh, and store it and visualize it in a, a useful way. The thing to know about um, Twitter has a, what's, what's called a, an API. An API is basically a way for a piece of code that you've written to communicate with Twitter and get some data or push data into it. So Twitter has a search API, which means that I can write a couple of lines of code, which means it'll go to Twitter and pull data back. So it'll pull tweets. One of the issues with the Twitter search API is it only has data from the last seven days. So if you're running a class over 10 weeks, if you're not saving that data somewhere, storing that data somewhere, after seven days, it's potentially gone from, from the uh, Twitter API. But there are other ways of getting it back. So the first thing I wanted to do was to get the data out of Twitter and into uh, a spreadsheet. In this case, a Google spreadsheet. The advantage of a Google spreadsheet being that it's very easy to share. So immediately I've got storage of the information, so a record of it, and I've got a means to allow pe other people to look at it to um, see if they can make their own meaning from it. The last step is actually to graph that data in a way. Unfortunately, um, Google have a there are, have made it easy to publish data from a spreadsheet and then you can visualize it however you want. You can use various libraries. And so I developed something um, that would visualize the data from the spreadsheet, uh, hopefully providing meaning to anyone with a web browser so that they could have a look. So this is um, Phonar. So one of the nice things about putting the data into a spreadsheet is that it's quite easy to start summarizing the data. So uh, here we've just got some cells doing various operations. We've got um, spark lines here showing activity. So at a glance now, Jonathan can look at his class and suddenly see, you know, Soph Moat started slow, but um, she's picked up her, her activity. Jonathan is obviously at the top because he's the tutor and he's um, trying to stimulate conversation. He's responding to messages. And then on the right-hand side, we've got the, the graph. So let me show you what that looks like live. In fact, um, so the spreadsheet's a template, so people can make as many copies of it as they like. Here's the search term we're using, and here's the archive of tweets which goes back, um, I think, to September. As part of this, we've got the summary, so we can see the summary of what's going on. And if I click on this button here, and fingers crossed, we get a graph. The, this graph has been drawn from the data in the spreadsheet. And as we're, whereas often with Node Excel, I was just generating flat images, this is an interactive image. So I can actually click on Alex and I can see the things Alex has tweeted. I can see the things Alex has been tweets that um, he's been mentioned by someone else in. And I, I've got various other summaries of the class. And we can see that there are um, a lot of isolated nodes. So these are people that have tweeted, at the tweeted in the class. So here's, here I am. And the reason I haven't got connections is because uh, I haven't mentioned 
anyone else in the class. So this again is you know identifying people who are on the periphery of the class potentially who are not engaging. So I can see quickly at a glance some of the core people of the class, the people that I might want to follow and see what they're they're saying. Does that make sense? General nodding. Yeah. This, this does make sense. I'm, ju I just, I'm failing to understand what the graph gives us. I, I can see from, there's a list on the left where you can see the number of tweets and retweets and, and that tells me pretty much what I need to know, that Jonathan Worth is, is the main guy mm -hmm. here and then there's a bunch of other people tweeting a lot and if I went down to the bottom of that list, I'd see all the people who aren't engaging. Yeah. What does this network diagram give me that that doesn't? Um... So we've, the, we've got a column here of, of ats. So these are the mentions. So um, what this doesn't give is if I'm engaging with just one or two people or if I'm engaging with the whole class. So if I jump on... Sorry, I've lost the window. So I can see, for example, aren't Twitter handles great? MD funds. Um, I can see that a lot of his, you know, he's he's got six replies. I can see that, you know. There, there are a couple of people that he's just replying to. Not, uh, you know, it's, you know, you could say that he's potentially within the clique with these people. Does that make sense? Yeah, I can see how you could, you could identify cliques from a diagram like that. that, that would be, that could be useful. Sorry, I was trying to grab the speaking stick too fast. <laughs> um, I guess my concern about this is that sometimes I think um, things like this are more interesting to kind of ed tech people than to students. Mm. Um, and, and, I, and I wonder about the, the, uh, whether it's appropriate or whether it's effective in a sort of a, a class where if your main goal is to encourage people to participate, then... If you're showing them a sort of a, it, it might be great for the people who see that they they tweet the most and mm. and and they're really um, often retweeted and you know wow I'm popular everybody loves me and then the people at the bottom of the list are you know what how, what's the effect on them I mean is it motivating or is it kind of that they feel like I'm I'm a loser at this class um, I, I guess I, you know I don't I'm not saying that I know the answer but that does worry me a bit and and does the quantity because this is really measuring quantity and not quality of interaction. You know, does the quantity really mm. mean a lot as well? Well, the, I, yeah. I think the danger of any intervention is that if it's not um, contextualized rightly, correctly, then it can be demotivational um, to students. Um, I think that's one of the big issues with learning analytics in general is um, if we get to the point where computer says no, and people just, you know, they switch off or, you know, it works opposite to, to how you'd, you'd like. Obviously, it's easier for people at the top to feel motivated. Um, we're a list-centered society. We want to be at the top of things. Um, so I think, yeah, it's, again, I think it perhaps goes back to expectations of, you know, if you're setting the expectation of 
we don't expect you to be top of the volume list. Um, you know, we still value the comments you make, even if there are, there are few. And I think that's where feedback mechanisms come in place, so that if you are seeing a student who is co contributing very valuable stuff, but not much, then to provide feedback to them, to say, we really value your contribution, or to promote it to other people in the class. And there may be something about, you know, if there's an idea of what good looks like. Mm. I mean, I think this stuff is really interesting when it comes to comparisons. It might be comparisons between what happens offline and what happens online, or between one year and the next, or, okay, we've got a load mm. of kind of um, outliers here. Um, we know that we have a, an inclusion issue, or we can see there's a big centripetal thing going on where there's a load of people who are really well connected. Maybe then that becomes actionable. Mm. The last thing I just want to highlight is, um, so we, I've focused a bit there on um, hashtags, so we're, we're pulling hashtag information. Quite a f one of the things that um, people aren't aware of is that you can actually, if you're a bit creative with your with your search terms, um, let me try and grab that. Let me just go here is that you can get, actually get a lot more out of Twitter. Let's copy the hyperlink. So here's a version of the Tim, no, that's not right. Let's try that again. In fact, let me just, uh, I have quite a few of these. Um, let me see, so, so if you're a bit creative with your search terms, you can actually put different operators in. So this uh, earlier I asked you to vote um, on the poll every question, every question. So I can say with my search term two, and I'm picking up uh, the operators for the, the numbers. So uh, if I run that now, I can, I've got the responses stored. Uh, that was one of the issues with Poll Everywhere. It didn't actually give me a record of this data. So I can take this data offline and I can do various analysis with it. The other thing is I can now ask students to actually um, add additional information to the end of their tweet. So not just vote on the response, but to say why they think that response is correct. And again, you might use that information in another way. Another thing, yeah. So what are the, li what are the limits of um, how much can that store? What, 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 at what rate? Um, the, the, the spreadsheet is limited by uh, Google's pa capacity. So it's about, uh, it's a quarter of a million cells, but because there are a number of columns um, within this. Um, so I'm picking up additional metadata about how many people, um, you know, their profile image. So it's 30,000 tweets I think you can get but in a spreadsheet, um, you can set it to update. Uh, you can get 100 tweets per API call, and you can do, I think, 180 calls an hour. So you can basically fill up the spreadsheet um, very quickly. Um, but for the types of things I'm interested in, it's, capacity has never been an issue. 
Um, so the last one I want to show you is just something, another thing people, here we go, LSE page, is that um, a while ago Twitter started um, actually analyzing the links people were sharing. So it wrapped it in its own shortening service. So if you were actually to put a, a link in, in, as your search, then when we run this, what we get back, fingers crossed, is everyone that shared that link. And it doesn't, in that example, I've used a specific link, but it could be a general domain link. So I could just look at everything on the, so in fact, let me, if I just delete this, and delete. So we had 33 responses. So 33 people share that page. So that gives you some insight in terms of, you know, if you've got a, a course page, who's who's engaging with that, you know, sharing that resource. Or, if, you know, just general academic, you know, if you're doing research and you want to find out who's interested in your research, there's a way to do that. So um, I've, I've just put in, oh, didn't like that for some reason. Uh, let's try that one again. Oh, for some reason, it's not liking the link. Um, let's see if it likes that one. You can put in just the main link, so it's one. So, right, I've just got uh, 104 tweets uh, of, of people that have shared everything to, to my, my blog, essentially. So I think that's, you know, useful for the next version of Ref. <laughs> and I can, actually, I can see uh, this column here is how many people that person, that's their follower account and their friend count. So I can see if there's any, anyone influential sharing that re resource. So I think that's me. Um, I do have slides with whys and why nots of Twitter, but I think you've probably made, I would quickly, you know, idea of mobility, flexibility, community, um, lifelong connections. And yeah, that, you know, I think we've covered some of the why nots. So conscious that I've taken up a lot of your time. I'm very grateful for you. Um, I've finished. So oh, happy to take questions. Does, we've had quite a few questions as we've gone along, but mm. um, does anyone have any further questions for Martin at the moment? Twitter has now floated, you know, on the public. So yeah. I just wonder uh, if do you have any thoughts about whether they will go specifically for the education sector or not, unlike Google, because some universities are moving to Google in mm. a kind of official way. Um, I'm not aware of Twitter having a dedicated education wing yet, whereas a lot of Google Plus, um, possibly Facebook, do. So they haven't gone for that specific market yet to target it. Um, I don't think the flotation changes much. Um, you know, they were a commercial company before, and they're a commercial company now. They just now have shareholders. relies on using Twitter APIs, which I suspect that a lot of people working in academia have absolutely no clue how to do. <laughs> Can you recommend a couple of places online, perhaps, where one could 
learn how to properly work or usefully um, draft with your APIs? Um, well, there's my side. <laughs> uh, um, I'm trying to think of. I, uh, I'm conscious of a lot of academic researchers looking at Twitter data. Uh, I haven't looked at um, specific examples of how they're sharing what they're doing. I think a lot of that, ironically, is um, hidden. Um, one of the reasons for coming up with the, the Google spreadsheet was I wanted to remove some of that headache. So. This, the spreadsheet is interacting with the API. So as long as you could set up a search and follow the instructions to connect it to the Twitter API, you can set up the spreadsheet to automatically collect stuff for you so you don't even need to log into the browser each day. Um, I've got spreadsheets that have been running for years collecting data. Um, once it's in the spreadsheet, I think it's a lot easier for staff to actually do something with it. You know, Even if you don't want to work with the data in Google Spreadsheets, you can download it as a CSV, work on it with other programs, or down into Excel, uh, and you know do additional slicing and dicing as well. Uh, just just to sort of add to, add to that, we had a, a sort of quite exploratory workshop over the summer about uh, getting people together who were using social media. Mm. Um, as, as data sources and one of the things that came out of it was potentially whether we could run a session um, you know for, 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 for staff to sort of find out more about some of the tools we've been talking about and a practical mm. actually hands-on and I think that's something if there is interest then, then we talk to Martin about whether you might be prepared to come back or something I think for, for the Twitter stuff the um, node Excel as well um, they, they have a very supportive community. So um, if you tweet Mark, spelt with a, a C underscore Smith, he, he, he's always helping people out with Node XL. He's one of the original developers of it. And he's got a great tex textbook that he gives away for free if you ask him nicely, looking at social network analysis. No, we haven't got any more questions from Twitter. Oh, got one more question. Yeah. Um, I was just thinking about this sort of analytics of tweets and analytics more generally. And my worry is that we're, we're, we're doing a lot of counting of metadata. Mm. But how do we know that the, the things that the metadata describe are themselves of interest? Uh, I mean, you, you alluded to content analysis before. I mean, that might be interesting to take you know, a course where people are tweeting a lot and actually see what are they tweeting about mm. and how is that contributing to the class or to their learning. But that question opens up to all sorts of analytics. I mean, I feel like there's this big rush to everyone wants to do analytics, but no one seems to be questioning what, what are the data that they're counting and, and are, why are they useful? What are they actually meaningful? Mm. And that, that's my concern about this whole field. Really. Sorry, that's not a question. I'm just <laughs> basically just moaning. Sorry. What's you, what do you think about that? <laughs> I think it's very true. And um, the danger also as well is um, Campbell's Law. Like, you know, once you start measuring something, it becomes gamed, you know, which you can use positively. You, know, that, you, know, you can use that to create the behaviors that you want. Um, but, you know, it does exist. So if you start saying, we'll count the number of tweets you do, you might just get a load of rubbish because people are gaming it. So, yeah, it's an issue. We'll draw things to a close there. If you could just join me in thanking Martin for a very enlightening uh, discussion and, and, and talk today. So thank you very much.